Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this week's video, we are in Turkey, still in the region of Cappadocia, the larger region of Cappadocia. And I've brought you to this little house to discuss creating HDR panoramics. It's pretty cold this morning. The sun's just risen up. So I need to warm up, get moving. Let's get photographing. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is James Kerwin and this this is me. I'm an architecture and interior photographer from the UK that is now based in Istanbul. I love shooting heritage, abandoned places, relics, ruins, hidden gems and ghost towns, as well as off the beaten path locations all around the world. You can catch my content weekly, well, when life doesn't take over. So why don't you join me for the ride by subscribing and you can also check out my website in the description below. So what equipment are we going to be using for this? I'm going to be using my Canon R5 and of course I'm going to be placing that camera on a tripod and I've mentioned my tripod many times on this channel you can check it out in the link in the description above I complete that setup with a geared head I'm using the Sunway Photo GH Pro 2 that allows me to fine tune my compositions so the piece of kit that I haven't mentioned is my lens setup and for that I'm going to be using my 17mm tilt shift lens I'm using that with the adapter to be able to get it from EF to RF mount system. So the first thing is, is there's a lot of detail in here. So the idea of creating a panoramic would mean that from our camera's position here, like you're looking at on this view, we'd be able to capture the top of this, the middle and the bottom and extend our field of view, giving us a, a, a nicer overall look and feel to the, to the result. If we're using a wide angle lens in this shot, you're gonna capture something like you've seen behind me here. However, you're cropping off an awful lot of the top here, which is where a lot of that detail is. This, as you see here, is at 15 mil. We could shoot in portrait orientation, of course. But if we do that, the problem we've got is we've then got a very thin image, a very tall image with a lot of foreground. We want to create a balance in our image, like I spoke about on other episodes. So that means using the tilt shift, we'll be able to get the width of 17 or 24 mil in each of our three frames, top, middle, and bottom. When we do this, the results will be much more stunning. We'll be able to capture the width of this building as well as the height, and that is important. Okay, so what's the main benefit of using a tilt shift lens? It's their movement. So take that off there. I've talked about tilt shift before on the channel, a few years ago now. I probably need to update those videos at some point. I've linked those in the description below. It's kind of all about tilt shift lenses, but essentially on the right hand side here, we have a lock in pin and you can kind of see that there. If we undo that on the left hand side, let me switch around. There, we then have the ability to actually shift our lens up and back down to the bottom into this kind of position while our camera is nice and straight on our tripod. And that's a huge thing because that allows me to then capture the three images. So there is a couple of other benefits to this technique as well. One of the main ones is you're increasing your resolution tenfold. If you're capturing a scene on a 40 megapixel R5 here, number one, number two, number three, when you join those together, you're gonna to have something like 120 roughly megapixels, but you are cropping a section of the image as we're gonna see later. You that down to probably somewhere around 100, but still, that is a huge file. Print resolution is amazing. If you're ever going to print the files, it gives you the ability to crop anywhere within that frame. That means we could actually reduce our floor, our you know, boring kind of tiles down here. We could just lift up the frame and, and actually crop something a little bit tighter, but with still maintaining that huge resolution. But the main benefit, of course, is like I've mentioned, it gives you the ability to be able to include width in the image, even though it's portrait orientation or vice versa. For example, we can include height in our image if it's landscape orientation, but we're not doing that today. We're gonna to be doing a portrait orientation image. Okay, I've jumped into camera already because the sun is coming up much quicker than I anticipated. I've now got this kind of like light casting on the left-hand side of the frame. And at the moment it looks kind of okay uh, it looks like we've done it on purpose, but to be honest with you, uh, I preferred it before. It was really nice and soft and the light was kind of coming across, but we can still work with this scene. 
But let's talk you through this process. First of all, camera's on the tripod, nice and steady, no, not going anywhere. You can see the geared head here. That works by turning these levers here independently, shifts each of the three axis and you can do it like so. I've actually lined my camera up there nicely and to do so what I've done is overexposed on the back of the LCD to be able to see everything and then I've pulled my exposure back to where I need it to be to take the photographs. My settings are as usual for me here. This lens performs best at f8 so I'm on f8. Next we're just framing up the image and that's more difficult than it looks. Why is it more difficult than it looks? Well, the actual building shape itself is actually a little bit off, and that means it's gonna be more difficult. So for example, the tiles on the back side actually come in at a slight angle, and the ones on the front here, in front of me, literally go off slightly to the right. So what we have to do there is position our camera exactly perfect to line, all, you know, line everything up. The next thing as well is um, we probably wanna get this a little bit up. We want to be in this sort of position, locking this nice and firm so it doesn't go anywhere, our centre column. And another tip to eliminate shake when we're taking these images is to activate your 10 or 2 second timer. That means when you press the shutter button you step away from the frame, it means that you're not going to be kind of, any wobble is going to be eliminated from your you know, shake of you touching the camera. Before things get any worse in terms of lighting here, I'm going to take those images. The middle is now lined up correct. I've got my exposure bracketing activated. Three brackets, two stops apart, and they're activated on here. Another tip for exposure bracketing. When you're actually activating that, make sure you put it on auto bracketing. Each time you manually go back to the camera, fine tune, you know, adjust this button to actually change your shutter speed, there is more and more chance of you knocking or shifting the camera's position, which again is might, not necessarily, but it might alter what your kind of end result looks like in a panorama. ISO is 200, but I'm just going to reduce that now down all the way to 100. That's absolutely fine. And with that, I'm going to just adjust my shutter speed. And I'm going to bring my middle exposure down to 160th of a second, which is minus one on my exposure bar. That's going to give me another bracket at plus one and one at minus three. So of course we're using aperture f7.1, f8, f9, the sharpest point of our lens where it performs best. And in this lens here, in this camera combination, it's f8. Because of our arches are nearer the front element of the lens, if we focus on them, there is going to be a slight difference in the rear and the windows at the back. And that's what we're trying to avoid. It might be that one day we look to print this image or it could be that we're displaying it in a large resolution monitor where you're going to notice the difference in the, you know, the actual shift of focus. So it's complicated. What we're going to be doing is one panorama for the front and one for the rear and we're going to stitch the images together as a pano and then we're going to stitch together the images of the pano at the back of the room too. Finally, we're going to join those both together in a focus stack. So let's do that. Let's take the first image, shall we? Focusing on the columns, we're we'll pressing shoot, two second timers activated. We're then going to unlock the lens, we're going to shift it to the top. Still focusing on the columns, but at the top of the columns, don't change your exposure, but do check your focus. That's very important. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be locking in our focus once again, but now we're focusing on the back wall of the building. Okay, that's the middle frame done. Then we're gonna be shifting to the top, refocusing, but this time again, making sure it's focused on the back. So we're talking now right up there at the top, up in that section, refocusing, which it is, pressing shoot, and finally shift the lens all the way to the bottom, move my focus point all the way up to the back wall again, Adjust it, nail the focus once more, and finally press shoot. So you'll notice I used manual focus here. Now these lenses are manual focus lenses, and that can really help you actually understand photography better and actually improve your skills. It's easy to manually focus with these lenses, especially in modern cameras. Now with my 5DSR, I would simply use the magnifying glass on the back, zoom on into a frame of the image or portion of the image, and then just 
use the front element of the lens here, shift it around to nail the focus. Then I'd zoom back out, check everything's good in the back of the LCD and press shoot. And I'd do that on each of the frames. With this modern camera, the R5, we've got focus peaking. We've also got something that I much prefer, which is the little box which turns green with the arrows that kind of align when everything's nailed. Now, using this manual focus technique that way, it's very precise. It's going to get everything nailed. Okay, so why this composition? Well, quite obvious. I wanted to be able to fill the frame of the camera having something close to the front element of the lens, but actually get that view looking through into the hall behind. Now, it was easy for me to lock in composition. You might think it was quite quick. Well, that's just come from experience mostly. We're constantly looking at our kind of framing throughout and just adjusting, fine tuning our composition. It might be that we're using the whole camera to position or the geared head to kind of fine tune parts of the composition. It's all about getting it right in camera. And another tip I can give you as well is stepping away from the camera from time to time, stepping away from the tripod, walk away, move away, look at where the camera's position is is it in the center of the room? Okay, the next thing as well is you'll notice that I used bracketing. Now, why did I use bracketing? Well, to be honest with you, with this, with the light when it came up, there's no real obvious need to use bracketing apart from to protect the highlights. If I was gonna shoot the scene now, the sun is much brighter in the sky and the highlights are gonna be burnt out. For this, we would then need to introduce two or three brackets. When it comes to my personal style, I do like to capture the brackets in camera because then when I'm looking through them in Lightroom, it can help me blend everything together to make my kind of photography style. If your editing style means that you can capture this with one bracket, you know, one exposure, top, middle and bottom, and then again for the back windows, top, middle and bottom, then so be it. For me, that's not the case. I like to have everything in camera and in my memory cards. I might not be coming back to this location again and I wanna have all of the data available to pull together the final results. So that just leads me to jump into Adobe Lightroom. We're gonna be using a combination of a Lightroom and just for one part of this process, Photoshop as well. And But trust me, if you're scared of Photoshop, don't worry about it. There's gonna be a really nice, easy thing to be doing in there. Most of our work, our hard lifting, is gonna be done using Adobe Lightroom. So here we are in Adobe Lightroom. And what we're looking for here is the image I've got with my thumb on it. Now that is a cue, a visual cue to me that I do in the field to remind me that the images before it are focus stacked. And I'm gonna select the nine just before it, so that's the back wall images. And we're going to select all nine of them, so that's three brackets, top, middle, and bottom. Right click, photo merge, HDR panorama. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna bring up a preview box. Now, depending on your machine, that's gonna take a certain amount of time. And the images that we're gonna be doing here is, of course, architecture. So what we wanna do is select perspective. You can play around with boundary warp, but for tilt shift lenses, it's kind of irrelevant. Auto crop, I do recommend leaving on because it's gonna crop off the white edges. And you can play around with auto settings. Now, for me, I'm gonna leave them on for this um, demo just because it's gonna make our process a bit quicker for you here on YouTube. But essentially, you're gonna be wanting usually those off so you can do the settings yourself. What we're then gonna do is we're gonna basically merge those together. Once it's done that, we're gonna select the other nine. That's the front nine. And we're gonna do exactly the same process. Right click, photo merge, HDR panorama. Once that's joined together, we're gonna to delete those nine and the initial nine images, and we're gonna just work now with those two new DNG files. And same thing, we can basically delete all of the other images. So, we'll select those two blue images now that I've now marked blue, and we can, again, same thing, right click, edit in, and this time, all the way to the bottom, open as layers in Photoshop, and that's gonna open them like so. Once we've done that, we can select both images by uh, clicking on the layers on the right hand side we go edit in auto align layers and that's going to align the layers just like so and you can do that a couple of times and once you've done that you can then do exactly the same thing but this time go edit and we go all the way down to auto blend layers now that's going to take X amount of time again to blend those together depending on your machine and when it does so it's going to give you a preview on the two layers of what's in focus and what's not and for me it's showing left and right but that's because I've got a damaged lens here it's before I fixed it but for you it would show back and front once we've done that we select both files again both layers 
We flatten them by right clicking, flatten image, then we go file, save, and it sends those, or that image, should I say now, back to Lightroom right here, and it offers that up as a TIFF. What we can then do is delete all other blue images, get rid of those completely from our disk. We don't want any more confusion, and this is now our TIFF file we're gonna be working with. We can go into develop and we can tweak around with this auto align settings. We can play around with our transform, our verticals, her horizon. And one of the tricks I can give you while you've got your crop tool on and you're selecting your crop is to use the O button and cycle through your image overlays to make sure oh, that kind of assists you in kind of cropping your image and getting it precise and where you want your crop. You can then look at your basic settings and we could do stuff like tweaking the contrast, and exposure overall to basically boost up where it is you want it to be. So highlights, blacks, bring the whites up. We can make this really pop. But from this point on, really, the choice is yours as to what you want to do with it. That's really when it comes to styling an image. Okay then, so let's check out the final panorama result. I think I like it, it's pretty nice. Of course, you could get this at various times of the day and I've chosen a time of day where this sun's coming in. You can kind of like work with what you've got. You can be quite creative. You can pull elements into your foreground using the tilt shift lens and that's another real benefit of this. You can get the width, like I mentioned. The kit we used was simple in terms of like a tripod, a camera, but the tilt shift lens has the ability to do the kind of technique I just mentioned seamlessly, to be honest with you. So could we do these images in another way? Well, yes, we could. We could actually flip our camera into portrait orientation and capture a kind of scene as left, middle and right, shifting our lens across. There's a little rotate pin on the barrel and you can press that in and rotate the lens around and that then allows you to shift the lens left, middle and right. When you do so, you're gonna have the same focus things to bear in mind. Check your focus throughout and make sure everything is nailed. Other than that, it's gonna to stitch together in exactly the same manner I'm going to give you a varied result. I need to go and get some breakfast and go and collect the guys. I say the guys because I'm on a photo tour here in Cappadocia. It's my last one of the year and this year has been pretty amazing. We do this stuff in tours. We're talking about getting the camera on tripod, tips and tricks, giving them good locations to practice this craft. Something very different, I think. I've got more stuff coming up in 24 and 25. If you're interested, you can check that out in the link in the description below. And this is my last one for this year. Next year's already looking pretty busy. So if you're interested, jump in straight away and grab your chance because uh, they're not gonna hang around for long. I do have actually have normally quite a big waiting list for trips and as soon as I'm releasing stuff, things go fairly fast. So if you're interested and wanna be a new participant on one of the trips, please do join me, I'd love to have you along. I hope this video has helped you. If you've got any comments, please do leave them below. We'd love to see you along again in the future. I'll respond to you as soon as I can. And uh, yeah, that's me for now. Bye-bye.